being said, uh, I'm going to be talking about kind of my perspective towards explainable AI, um, which will be using some linear algebraic approaches uh, to do some machine learning tasks. Uh, so this is uh, joint work. Um, it's kind of a conglomeration of works with uh, these fine folks here. So Dr. Han Lu at Wisconsin, Laura Bolzano at Michigan, uh, my PhD student, Chris Domier, uh, my former postdoc, Long Zhu Long, uh, Kian Ham, and Hong Chin Tsui. In addition, a lot of the applications that I'll show at the end of the talk are uh, due to my own students in my own research group, as well as some REU uh, undergrad um, program students as well, uh, pictured here. Uh, you can probably guess which years each of these was taken. <laughs> uh, okay, so just going to begin with kind of some motivating examples. None, none of this is actually my own work um, at the beginning here, um, but I wanted to like kind of set the stage for why I think the approach um, that we're going to look at is actually important. Um, so here's, you know, some classical examples and probably many folks have seen these. Um, so we're training uh, a neural net to recognize images and classify the image. In this case, you're trying to classify animals. Um, and so here we just have a picture of a panda and the neural net that this has been trained on, I have the citation down below if you're interested, uh, has predicted that indeed it is a panda with you know, reasonable competence. Um, and now there has been a very small amount of distortion added. I won't say noise because it's not random. Um, but a very small amount of distortion, uh, and now you see this image. To the human eye, this looks exactly the same, right? It looks like a panda, it doesn't look like much has changed. Um, but suddenly the neural net confuses the panda for a gibbon. Uh, and I actually I had to Google what a gibbon was. I didn't know what the animal looked like, and it looks like this. So yeah, there's some similarities, but um, clearly this distortion should not have led dog on this tray. And even more um, kind of devastating is that the confidence has actually increased uh, quite drastically. Other classical examples is uh, a similar situation where a pig becomes an airliner. Um, other things besides just adding distortion can also fool these neural nets. So for example, if you take an image and rotate the image, uh, so here, this revolver, which was correctly identified as a revolver, has been rotated, and now the neural net believes it's a mouse trap. Uh, same with this image here of a boathouse becomes a guillotine, and a china cabinet becomes a spotlight. Um, so lots of other ways to distort things. Um, in addition to kind of image classification tasks, when we're looking at applications like facial recognition and that kind of thing, um, these glasses have been built again. Kind of the, the citations down below. Um, and they were built in such a way, you know, they have these colors and these textures here on the glasses. They were built in such a way that you can design these glasses to either fool a facial recognition system into thinking you're somebody else. You can choose that somebody else. Um, or you can fool the facial recognition system to not even recognize you as being a face. Um, so this is kind of a real life example of, you know, the Clark Kent putting on glasses and fooling everybody. This is actually fooling your own um, as you can imagine, this kind of um, application with facial recognition and many other applications has huge impact on many areas and in particular social justice and racial justice. Um, so, you know, you've probably heard a lot of um, things in the news about, you know, people with certain skin tones not being recognized as much as others. Um, this even goes outside of the imaging world right into predicting credit scores and, and this kind of thing. So a huge range of um, social justice and other uh, impacts um, that are really, really critical. Um, going into kind of another imaging realm with self-driving cars, this is another area where, you know, object detection from imaging is really important. Uh, so here's a, a stop sign that a self-driving car is trying to recognize. There's you know, a little bit of graffiti, some stickers, um, but it does fine with the stop sign. Um, however, if you place these stickers more strategically, uh, you can actually fool the self-driving car now to confuse the stop sign with a 45 uh, mile per hour speed limit sign. Uh, just run through that scenario in your mind and you see what the devastating consequences would be of this error. Um, I won't go into this too much, uh, but there's, you know, applications beyond imaging, there's audio applications where the same kind of thing happens. Uh, here's a, just a quote that's being spoken by text, uh, spoken with speech, and uh, the neural net indeed can interpret the text, but if you add just a small amount of distortion, the human ear hears nothing different, um, but suddenly the text 
uh, completely changes from uh, what is being predicted. Uh, there's issues with human accents, right? And, and this just makes things even more complicated. Um, there's even, uh, so the SPIDAF ensemble model is an example where uh, you're trying to actually ask um, the machine a question and, and get an answer. And there's plenty of information there for the machine to correctly give you the answer. And, but if you give additional information, which you know shouldn't confuse the machine, it actually can confuse the machine. You can give the wrong answer. Again, I won't read that in detail, but just to give you an idea. Uh, more imaging examples, you know, simple uh, Pong game where the computer is trying to block the ball on both sides and do a little bit of very simple AI. Uh, you can distort the image in a very simple way to confuse uh, the computer to move the paddles in the wrong direction, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, with all this in mind, you kind of ask yourself, okay, how, how, do, I, how do we protect ourselves? How, how do we ever get around this? Um, and it, in my, from my perspective, there's sort of two main approaches. Uh, the first is just to train against these adversaries. Um, the idea there would be to generate your own adversarial data that fools your network and then train your network against that adversarial example. Um, this does improve generalization, obviously, um, but it does lack ro ro robustness, right? You can kind of imagine this reminds me of this, uh, you know, old school game here where you have one thing popping up, you kind of smash that down, something else pops up, you smash that down. It's not clear if you'll ever get to a, a stable state where you have no more uh, bad examples. Uh, the second approach is um, kind of defensive distillation which the idea here is to use a second model, which is sort of smoothed in the adversarial directions. Um, so what that means is you would train on the primary model's output probabilities rather than their threshold of decisions. Um, this can be applied to any feed-forward neural network. Um, it has been seen to reduce prior attacks from 95% to 0.5% success, the attacks being successful there, so that's a good thing. Um, so it is more robust against attacks, um, but uh, a few years ago, I guess five or six years ago now, um, these uh, other benchmarks were developed for which even this approach fails. So going the right direction, but not, not quite there. Um, so, okay, so then you might ask yourself, uh, well, why do these models fail so easily? I put easily in quotes uh, because, you know, coming up with these adversarial examples, of course, is non-trivial, um, but looking at them from the human eye perspective, they are very trivial. Um, and so I think uh, some of the reasons are, uh, for first, data is very sparse in high dimensional space, right? If you look at the images that we're actually using in applications compared to their, you know, pixeled ambient uh, dimensional space, it's very large and the data itself is very sparse. And so there's lots of rooms kind of geometrically to, to nudge things around and get you into bad situations. Um, and in addition, the models are often very overconfident. Um, especially given this observation that they actually are seeing a very, very small piece of the space, and yet they have so much confidence in making predictions. Um, and then I really like this quote from uh, Ian Goodfellow, of course, um, the computer scientist, and he said, uh, many of the most important problems still remain open, both in terms of theory and in terms of applications. We do not yet know whether defending against adversarial examples is a theoretically helpless endeavor, or if an optimal strategy would give the defender an upper ground. On the applied side, no one has yet designed a truly powerful defense algorithm that can resist a wide variety of adversarial example attack algorithms. So kind of summarizes it very well there. Okay, so then we get to the, <laughs> the darker side of, well, how can we ever trust an output, right? You know, these neural nets and uh, transformers, you know, all, all these machine learning uh, methods are being used widespread. Um, so, you know, how are we ever going to trust them? Um, and so, of course, there's there's lots of directions happening here. One is to understand, you know, deep models uh, better. Uh, and I think that's a, a great direction. Um, and so the perspective kind of that I have is, well, if we could understand why a model selects a particular output and like, why does a pig become an airliner? Can we actually see that in a human interpretable way? Uh, and then we not only further our understanding of the method, but also begin to develop trust, um, hopefully cautiously. And the good news is that there are approaches uh, outside of kind of deep models that allow for this type of transparency immediately. And those are the methods I'm going to talk about today. So the first method I'm going to talk about is non-negative matrix factorization. I'll just give a little brief intro to this. Um, so the name kind of says it all, but you have a, uh, a large scale data matrix here. I'm going to just um, 
view the rows as maybe users or individuals, and I'll view the columns as variables. And so you capture some sort of information here. Uh, maybe this is movie ratings, and we have you know users watching the movies, and the movies would be the variables, and then the ratings would be the data. Um, and the goal is to factorize this data matrix into two very low rank components, uh, which both have non-negative entries. And we're going to interpret these low rank components as being a users by topics component and a topics by variables component. Uh -huh. So why non-negativity, first of all, and then I'll talk about what the topic could actually mean. Um, so in NMF, uh, because you're using non-negativity, uh, each column uh, or row, if you transpose, of the data matrix has to be represented as a non-negative linear combination of these dictionary atoms and the other factor. And so thus, these little atoms or building blocks that you're learning must be positive parts of your data. Um, and so in a classical example, this is by um, this famous paper from 1999, uh, where they're doing this with um, images of faces. Um, the components that you end up learning are actually piece, pieces of the face. So you see noses in here. I know this image is small, but you can take my word for it. Uh, you see eyes, you see mouths, you see noses, and that kind of thing. And those are, you know, very understandable parts of the face. And that is, gives some explainability, interpretability. And that's compared to something like, say, PCA that learns these sort of eigenfaces that, because there's negativity in loud, you know, they, they combine to build a face, yes, but there's no real meaning behind, you know, what these blocks look like. Um, so that's the non-negativity role, and then let's just kind of dive into a topic uh, question here for a second to get a handle on uh, what this factorization is actually doing and how you interpret it. Again, because we have non-negativity at our disposal, uh, we're going to look for large values. So large values in these factors are going to give us information, again, contrary to typical factorizations where you don't have that. And so if I look in this first kind of users by topics matrix, um, I look for a large value here, I say, okay, this user in this row has a large association with whatever this topic in this column is. Okay, well, what is this topic in this column? What does that actually mean? We go look in the other factor and I look for large variable, large values in that corresponding topic. Um, and so this large variable, for example, would have a large association with whatever this topic is. And you kind of go back and forth between these two and that builds some sort of intuition. So let me just uh, give a very concrete example. Uh, going back to the movie ratings example, if we have users by movies and the data contains their ratings, then I might look for a large value here and I say, okay, this user must like whatever this topic is. Maybe in this setting, topics might be genres of movies. Um, let me go investigate what this, what this genre is. I go over to that corresponding genre and this factor and I look for large values. I see what those large values correspond to. Maybe they correspond to these three movies here. And I say, okay, that genre might be romantic movies. And this user might really like romantic movies. And then you can do recommendation systems and um, classification tasks and so on using this information. Um, OK, so uh, mathematically, the goal of NMF, uh, as I said, is to factorize the data matrix, which I'm now going to call x, which will be d by n into a pair of low rank non-negative matrices w and h, which will be d by r, r by n. Um, and so the very simple version is just to minimize this optimization problem. We're just minimizing the total Frobenius error between the factorization over all non-negative uh, matrices of the correct size. And so we're going to call these kind of the dictionary matrix, which contains the atoms, and the coding matrix, which explains how those atoms are built. Um, there's also an online version of this. Uh, so instead of having a fixed data matrix and learning a factorization, you might have streaming data that comes in over time. And the goal here will be to learn a factorization that is best in expectation if we assume some sort of stochastic model on the data. Um, and this can be used uh, for prediction as well. This was something that we promoted uh, a little while back. Um, and the very high level idea there is if you can learn these factorizations at each time step um, over some sort of window, then you can imagine sliding your window into the future and whatever factorization you learn into the future uh, gives you actually a prediction. Uh, I'll just briefly mention that everything I'm saying today does apply to tensors as well um, in a non-trivial way, but in an analogous way. But I'll just keep most of the examples um, in the matrix world just because it's easier, of course, to write down and, and understand. Um, so a little uh, peek into one of the results just to see what sort of a theoretical result looks like, and then I'll have a bunch of applications as well. 
Um, so in actually order to minimize this objective, um, which again, I'll just focus on this simple objective, although of course in reality you use regularizers like uh, an L1 norm to promote sparsity in the topics and that kind of thing. But for now, let's just say we're just, we're just optimizing the forbidden user norm. Um, one can use something like plot corn descent. And so the idea there is, you know, you fix W, you minimize for H, you fix H, you minimize for W, and so on. And so in the kind of static case where we have just a single data matrix, the iterates look like this, and we're just fixing one, solving for the other, and so on. And you, of course, hope for some convergence. Um, and this approach actually just leads to a very simple algorithm um, from that same paper, which is a multiplicative update rule. And you can actually just write down the updates entry-wise of H and W in this way. Um, you're essentially just computing some gradients and you get non-negativity for free actually in the way these things fall out. Uh, so it's a really simple algorithm. You can see now why I had some undergrads, you know, jumping in uh, and using this approach uh, for the summer programs. Uh, so what is known about this? It's known that the objective error is non-increasing with this multiplicative update rule, um, but there is no guarantee to converge to a stationary point. Okay, so we're gonna go to the online setting. Uh, if the data matrix X now is drawn randomly from some sample space, uh, according to some distribution, say pi, uh, then we ask, can we still learn the best factorization that describe this data and maybe in law in some way? So here's the same kind of uh, schematic in the, in the online case. Everything looks pretty much the same, except now, of course, the data is changing itself. So we have X1, X2, X3, and so on. Um, but we're still gonna do the same thing. We're gonna have the W and H from the previous time step, fix one, solve for the other, and so on. So the approach is, is really pretty much the same. Uh, there's a couple of logistics here we'll have to, to worry about, but we'll be able to get around those. Um, and so we would like to say something like this. If, um, if XT is say, if they're IID or if they're a Markov chain, uh, some assumptions here, which I'll talk about more specifically in a moment, uh, then we would hope that this online NMF prop would give you a sequence of W and H matrices such that maybe almost surely you get this sort of convergence, right? So as, as time goes on, the error in your factorization would converge to the best possible error over all W and H um, of the expected loss, right? So that's sort of the, the natural thing to ask. Um, I won't go too much into this. This is a little bit too much into the weeds, but if you're interested, I can talk more afterwards or I can refer you to the paper. Um, but the way we actually work on the theory here is we do add a, an L1 regularizer, like I mentioned, and you kind of create a surrogate for the loss function. That's typical, right, in this kind of optimization scheme. And you prove that that's a good surrogate um, and show that there's some, some almost sure convergence and so on. But I'll just sort of um, highlight the key issues here. Um, you end up getting a, a multiplicative scheme that sort of looks like this. Um, so because we have the data changing as well as the um, H and W factors themselves, um, the, uh, the algorithm looks something like this. So we update H by solving this optimization instance, and then we update W by minimizing this uh, kind of empirical loss uh, function here. And so if you start at this for a second, I won't make you actually do it, but I'll give you the punchline. Uh, it looks like you actually have to require yourself to store all previous major Cs. That's one thing because we're summing over all the history. And it also looks like you have to solve a lot of optimization instances. Um, but it turns out we can actually get around both of those, luckily. Um, so uh, this group of people here actually um, gave an algorithm to do this. And they also proved um, almost sure convergence in the case of IID data. So here was again this, this problem. Um, here we're going to replace the empirical loss again, like I said, with a surrogate that helps us get around um, the need to store the history. And so we're actually recycling the previously found um, coding matrices and using them as approximate solutions to the subproblem. And so there's only uh, a single optimization for um, W instead of many of them. And in addition, uh, the good news is you can even get around having to store the history by aggregating uh, the data. So again, too much detail here, um, the notation and so forth. But if you're worried about the, the computational feasibility, it's actually, um, it's actually quite easy. These are literally all, all the variables you have to store in a given iteration. You don't have to actually store the history um, and solve too many instances. So computationally feasible, um, single optimization instance, and you can actually write down the algorithm in, in this four line kind of bit of code. And their theorem looked like this. So again, they assumed an ID assumption on the data. And they said let W and H be um, 
the solution to this, this uh, iterative optimization problem. Um, then you get some almost sure convergence for the surrogate function that you kind of threw there in the middle. Um, and you get uh, almost sure convergence of the gradient uh, to zero. So we were uh, looking at this problem at the beginning of 2020, um, trying to think if there was any big event going on in the beginning of 2020, there might've been. And so we were trying to use this uh, online NMF scheme to study COVID data. Um, and so we kind of asked ourselves, you know, my ID assumption was something like COVID data is really uh, not realistic, right? At least one hopes that the case count, for example, tomorrow is definitely not gonna be independent of the case count today, right? That's obviously not how spread works. Um, so we wanted to generalize this and see if we could actually apply it um, to something like COVID data, weather data, all those kinds of things. And we wanted to kind of take a step away from the ID assumption towards something maybe a little bit more realistic. And in our minds, that was a Markov chain. Um, so it would make sense that, you know, the data tomorrow depends on the data today, but that could be enough. Um, and so, uh, of course, when you lose independence, things theoretically break down and, and it becomes challenging. Uh, so we were able to, um, to work on this for a bit and we left the algorithm exactly the same. We've just been able to generalize the result theoretically. So this was our result. Uh, we said um, XT is an irre irreducible markup chain um, with unique stationary distribution pi. And then if W and H are the solutions to the above problem, uh, then the following holds. So you get um, kind of a similar result before as the surrogate is doing what you wanted to do in expectation. And more importantly, um, you get the same uh, convergence of the gradient at zero almost surely. So same conclusion, uh, but generalize the theory there. Okay, so that's NMF, um, and I'll you know, motivate you know NMF with applications, kind of tying back to why I believe this is explainable. But I kind of mentioned that with the non-negativity uh, constraint being a reason that you actually have human interpretability um, in those factorizations. And so I just wanted to mention more briefly um, another factorization that I think has the same sort of property as the CUR decomposition. Well, just a little review because this doesn't get as much love as it deserves. Um, if you have a square matrix A, um, <clears throat> then you can create a sub column matrix of A called C and a row sub matrix of A called R. And if you look at the intersection of those two, the literal intersection, so the overlap of the columns and the rows, uh, that forms a sub matrix called U. And then the classical result uh, for the matrix case is if the ranks of U and A are the same, then this actually gives you a factorization for A. So you can write A as um, C times the pseudo inverse of U times R. Uh, why does this even fit in the context? Well, this is another factorization where these factors are actually human interpretable, right? C is a, just a submatrix of your own data. So of course you understand what that is. R is the same. Uh, so your building blocks become actually parts of your data. And so I think this can be really useful for that interpretability. Um, <clears throat> Again, I won't go into too much of details how you actually um, ensure that you can get a CUR decomposition. There's a couple of different ways. There's some random sampling methods and deterministic ones. There's some interesting results there. Complexity is not, is not bad at all. It's actually less than SVD for reasonable ranks. Uh, so it's easy to implement and it's computationally efficient. And so what we wanted to ask was, you know, again, a lot of this data is tensor data. Um, can we do something like a CUR decomposition in the tensor world? and we generalize this to multi, multimodal data. <clears throat> so just a little quick um, tour of what we can do in the tensor world. Uh, so of course, everything gets complicated. You know, the, the notion of rank go, goes away. It's not obvious and factorizations and everything. Um, but there, there are many analogs, right? So this is the SVD analog, which is higher order SVD, HOSVD. Um, of a, a multimodal tensor with N modes uh, and multilinear rank R1 through Rn. So Kind of look at each mode individually and write down its rank. Um, then uh, you can actually write down sort of an SVD decomposition like this, um, where UIs are these kind of slice matrices and you have a sort of core tensor in the middle and you get multiplication this way. So HOSVD does exist. Um, <clears throat> and I won't go into the process there, but the complexity is complexity looks like this n times r times t to the n. Um, and so here's some motivation for trying to build a CUR uncertainty composition. Um, 
you know, when you're kind of trying to translate things for the matrix case, tensor case, the most natural thing to first do is say, well, hey, matrix, you know, a matrix is a tensor. It's a two mode tensor. So let's just write that down in tensor language. And so you can write down the matrix UR decomposition in tensor language. And it just kind of looks like this. Of course, it starts to get messy, but this is um, multiplication in the first mode, multiplication in the second mode. Uh, but you can write that down. And so that leads you to um, actually be able to, to generalize uh, a tensor decomposition in the CUR case. And there's actually two versions that we came up with. So these are our definitions and our results for what the decomposition gives you. Um, it looks like, oh my gosh, am I gonna read all this slide? I'm not gonna read the slides. Um, I'm gonna actually skip over. This is just a taste of what the theorem looks like. And then I'll show you in a picture um, what the tensor decomposition looks like. But there's two of them. This is uh, what we call a Chidori CUR and this is what we call a fiber CUR. Uh, but I think it's easier just to see it in photos. <clears throat> so this is first um, the Chidori CUR decomposition, which just in our picture here looks a lot like this toy game, which is a Chidori game. Thanks to this mix, mix in for uh, noting that. And so that's how we gave it its name. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're taking these three different colored um, subtensors here, the red, the pink, and the yellow. Um, and we're obtaining the C1 matrix. This is part of that sort of column matrix by unfolding this red tensor along mode one. And we're forming C2, the second <clears throat> column matrix by unfolding the green subtensor and so on. And then this kind of dotted line here shows the boundaries of the, the core tensor R. And then we build the decomposition that way. So again, we get a tensor decomposition based on actual um, sub data of your, your original tensor. And then the second one is uh, a fiber CUR. You can kind of see where that name comes from as well. In this case, we have a little bit more flexibility. Um, the lines here correspond to rows of C, the C matrices, and <clears throat> the red indices within them correspond to rows of the U matrix. And um, no, in this case, the lines are kind of flowing around. They don't actually have to intersect as core, unlike in this case where they actually do. So a very, very high level overview, but just to say that um, we have been able to develop the CUR decomposition in the tensor case. And I think it will be very useful going forward, given how useful it is in the matrix world as well. And again, we get that interpretability since it's built from the data. Um, I'm gonna skip over this, but there are also a robust version of this, um, similar to robust PCA. And we have some results there. Um, <clears throat> you can do things like uh, separating foreground and background and that kind of thing. And in all of our examples, the runtime that we see using CUR is just drastically better uh, than the others just because of, of how simple it is. I'll pause there and then I'm going to get to applications. But if there's any questions, let me know. And I should go tell what 50 past the hour, I assume. Um, yeah, roughly. Okay. Or a little bit before. Yeah, so that there's a little bit of time for questions, ideally. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I, I have a lot of applications, but I'll just kind of show you a highlight of some of them. Um, so the first application uh, that I've been working a lot with um, is uh, the application of, of Lyme disease. So this is a project called My Lyme Data. It's uh, hosted by LymeDisease.org, which is a nonprofit. Um, and so just a little background on Lyme disease, it's a vector-borne disease, uh, typically transmitted by tick, tick or insect bite or blood-to-blood -blood contact. Uh, the symptoms of Lyme often mimic those of others, like uh, multiple sclerosis, ELS, Parkinson's, fibromyalgia, and especially if not treated right away, it can become chronic. Um, there's a lot of similarities that we're seeing now between chronic Lyme disease and long COVID, so lots of similarities in terms of how the body reacts and the symptomology. Um, the CDC underestimates 300,000 new diagnoses each year. This is higher than many, many other very um, common diseases. Uh, nonetheless, it's poorly understood, it's poorly funded, it's poorly diagnosed, and it's poorly treated. Um, and so the, the CEO of Lyme disease.org, who's worked a lot in this area, has said, you know, this is a prime example of how data-driven research can really be helpful. It's less expensive, um, and you can get a lot of information. And so they gathered um, a patient registry. We've got about uh, 18,000 patients now, I believe. And they um, are essentially just filling out long surveys, everything from answering questions about their symptoms to which treatments they're in, to diagnosis questions. Uh, they can even upload images. They've had scans, uh, blood work, anything that they're willing to give. 
Um, and so we wanted to just uh, take a very small subset of this data, the symptom quality questions, and see if we could use something like an MF to understand what's going on with these patients a little bit better. Um, and so here I'm just, I'm just going to focus on this rightmost graph. These are just a couple of different techniques within the NMF framework. Um, and so we're listing uh, symptoms here that are common for the illness. And patients have rated their symptoms in terms of severity. And so we took all of that data. So we have users, the patients, and their symptoms with their ratings. And we applied NMF. Um, here we just had uh, R equals five. So we chose five topics. And what I'm showing you here in this plot is um, large values are the dark ones. So like these dark oranges are large values and smaller values are this kind of light yellow. And I've just grouped them in ways that make it a little bit easier to see how the large values clump together. And so you can see really there are, you know, five distinct topics here. Um, you can see the first topic corresponds to these four symptoms here at the top, nerve pain, psychiatric issues, muscle aches, heart symptoms, the second topic here, and so on. Um, a couple of interesting things um, that when we presented this to the board, uh, which consists of physicians who treat Lyme and study Lyme clinically, um, they noticed, you know, one thing which we, once we kind of explained what we were looking at, which is this bullseye rash symptom really doesn't fit in any topic. Um, and this was really uh, interesting to them because classically, uh, Lyme disease always presents with a bullseye rash. If you go to the doctor and you say, hey, I was bit by a tick, they're going to look and see if you have a rash. And if you don't, they're not going to treat you for Lyme. Um, that was about a decade ago. Now we're seeing actually that the percentage of patients that present with a bullseye rash is actually something more like 25 to 30 percent. So it's actually very low. And this kind of aligns with this, especially in this group of chronic patients. Um, many of them did not present with a bullseye rash. And so this doesn't really fit in the picture at all. Which thought was interesting. The other thing um, that they found interesting was this kind of middle topic here, which is memory loss, twitching, sleep, and cognitive impairment. Uh, the fact that there's a cluster of patients with that group of symptoms uh, and that symptomology setup um, suggests that there's sort of this neurologic manifestation, um, which is something that um, the clinicians have started to uncover. And so a lot of the research has been showing that Lyme manifests in cardiac ways and neurologic ways and musculoskeletal ways. And that um, this kind of suggests that those patients are indeed sort of isolated from the others. They actually are appearing in their own topic. Um, and so this kind of looks like maybe a neurologic manifestation. So again, you know, we're not doing any diagnoses. We're not actually claiming anything, but this kind of, this kind of work, in my opinion, kind of suggests directions to look into further. And so, um, you know, it's, I think it's good to present to clinicians and give them that, those kinds of ideas. Um, leaving the, the Lyme world, this is uh, using online NMF for image reconstruction. So not suggesting this is the best way to do compression, but it's interesting uh, that you can do it this way. So we just took an image, we divided the image up into patches, and we did a random walk through the patches. That gives you an online data, um, and then you can apply online NMF. Uh, and so what you end up doing there is you learn these kind of building blocks here, and you can use these building blocks to do compression like you would in, in any other setting. Um, but the nice thing about using NMF is you get building blocks that actually look like the image, right? You can see that there's different brush strokes here um, and different kind of pieces of the image that actually kind of match your data. So if there's, you know, any reason that in your compression scheme, you actually want the building blocks to have some sort of meaning, uh, then you could use NMF. Um, going uh, into other applications, so uh, applications like uh, classification and co-segmentation uh, and imaging. We've taken uh, a bunch of different images here. So we have images of bicycles, cars, dogs, and cows, and we want to train um, our classification procedure using an MF to classify and label these images. Um, not only do we get a very accurate classification here, um, but because, again, we get this interpretability in these factorizations, we can actually go back into the factors and highlight uh, which pixels actually are corresponding to the label the most. And so this is what we've done here. And if you just kind of glance through, we can just look at the middle row for the time being. Um, you see that the highlights are indeed of the animals in the cow picture. They are like the face of the dog in the dog pictures. The cars tend to be wheels and headlights and those kinds of things. Bicycles tend to be, you know, wheels and rims. 
Um, all of this is obvious to the human, right? That's how we would recognize uh, these objects. But it's not obvious that the machine learning algorithm is actually doing that, right? It could be that it learns grass. And when it sees grass, it thinks there's a cow, right? And so it's good to go back and actually be able to interpret, you know, why the algorithm is giving these labels. Um, so I think that's going, you know, out of that black box and kind of being able to see inside and see what it's doing. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, this is how we um, developed that uh, online NMF tool uh, past our initial results when we were looking at COVID data. Um, and so these are uh, looking at confirmed cases, that's in recovered cases. And this, again, was early 2020, so we had limited access. We had these six countries to look at. And what you're looking at here are the, the atoms, the building blocks that we learned um, for that time series data for these six countries. And the building blocks themselves, you know, we, we started them for quite a while. Um, there are some interesting things that you note, for example, China here is in, in this orange. Um, China seems to be, uh, you know, a lot different in most of these building blocks to the other countries. And that's not surprising in early 2020, you know, they were, um, they had a lot of different uh, case count information than, than the other countries. And so that makes sense. And then we can use this kind of predictive um, approach that I mentioned with the sliding window into the future uh, to actually make predictions for this data. And so what you're seeing here are the six countries that we made predictions for, and you're seeing um, the actual data in blue, and then you're seeing our predicted data in red. Um, and so you can see for Korea and the US and Germany, Italy and Spain, we, we do really well um, for the information we have. Um, we've matched almost exactly. Um, but for China, we actually really struggled. Um, so up here, for example, China reported a decrease and then a huge spike, and that really threw the online NMF algorithm for a loop, right? Then we started making these, these really uh, inaccurate uh, predictions up here, not really knowing if that spike was going to happen again. So that's the issue with this um, approach is, you know, it's very localized. So if you see a spike within your window, you're going to believe that that spike is going to reoccur. Um, and so it takes the algorithm a little bit of time to realize that actually, no, it's, it's not. Um, so I would eventually like to kind of combine uh, this approach, which is very localized with something more global, like with the SIR model, um, to see if those two combined can actually give better local and global predictions. Um, lots more applications. This is um, looking at EEG data. Uh, this is from the UC Irvine EEG alcoholism data set. So there are 64 electrodes, and the goal is to try to differentiate patients with alcoholism from patients without, uh, just given their, their EEG recordings. And so you're looking at um, the, again, the atoms that we learned from that EEG data. There's so many electrodes here, it's kind of hard to make sense of, although it's pretty rainbow. Um, but we got some interesting results. So um, what we did here was we, we did an online NMF, or you can even just say NMF um, factorization. And um, from those two factors, we then took um, a Pearson correlation. And so on the left here, what you're seeing is just a straight up Pearson correlation of the EEG data to begin with. And obviously in EEG data, you know, correlations are important. And you wanna see which nodes fire together, which nodes don't fire together and so on. Um, and so you see some interesting patterns here. You see, you know, really strong correlations between these two nodes and so on. Um, and then if we did the Pearson correlation on the ONMF factors, uh, we get this result, which looks like maybe a very clean version of the original Pearson correlation. You still pick up these very strong correlations, but the rest has been dampened. And so the neurologist team that we're looking at, uh, that we're working with, is sort of trying to, to uncover whether maybe this is sort of a denoising procedure, which would be really interesting. EEG data is very noisy. Um, and so anything to, to clean it up. And again, this is totally raw data. So nothing was actually cleaned. Uh, what we found even more interesting is the following. Um, so not only do we want to look at the actual correlations in the EEG data, but we also are interested in the correlation of the gradient. Again, you know, nodes that are increasing together or decreasing together also give you a lot of information. And so what we're seeing here on the left is the Pearson uh, correlation matrix for um, the data as well as the gradient of the data. And so you get a lot more kind of subtle um, correlations involved and the pattern becomes much more intricate. Um, and this is what we get in the middle here, where we do the same thing, um, but we run NMF on the data and the gradient, and then we take a Pearson correlation of those factors, and they look very, very similar. So it doesn't look like um, the ONMF, even though it's very simplified, um, doesn't actually lose much information. 
And then what I find even more interesting is if you increase the rank uh, in your NMF factorization, that was a parameter, right, that you could choose to give you the size of those factors. Um, and you withdraw the gradient. So you don't give NMF gradient information at all. You just run NMF on the raw data, but with a bigger gradient than you had before. Uh, so in this case, we like double the gradient. I think this was rank eight and this was rank 16. Uh, then you get this picture, which looks starkingly like the picture that you got when you gave the gradient information. And so I found this really, really interesting. Like NMF somehow is learning other information that's embedded within the data without explicitly giving it the information that you want it to use. So I think this is really interesting and exciting and um, something we want to look at further. Um, so I'll try to end um, probably here to leave time for questions. This was another um, interesting example where you had a mouse cortex and you're um, looking at fMRI data and you're trying to learn activation patterns. So there's a behavior or a stimulus being applied to the mouse and you're studying how the brain is, is changing over time. And the cool thing there is the two factors that you learn, uh, this is a tensor factorization, but the factors that you learn are in space and in time. And so you can have you know, a neurologist come and look at this and say, oh, these areas of the brain are, you know, correspond to some particular aspect of, of the brain behavior, what was happening at this time. And you can look at this factor and you can see how it correlates with it in the time domain. And you can say, oh yeah, this is a topic that's very highly correlated with you know, time equals one second. And then you can ask what was happening during that one second. So it gives you a very high level overview instead of having to stare at the video and try to piece things together. This tells you that you know overall, um, this area of the brain was active at this time and this time and, and kind of assess that way. So a really cool uh, overview. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, I have lots uh, more applications, of course, but I think those are the, the really good ones that highlight the point. So thank you so much for, for listening and happy to take any questions.